I grew up in Daly City, which is a city that I affectionately call the second Philippines, and it's a suburb of San Francisco. A lot of people who um, question where Daly City is, I'll just say, have you been to San Francisco? They say, yes. And I say, well, your ride from the airport to San Francisco, you passed Daly City. <laughs> so yeah, I'm from Daly City, California. I'm a little suburb, suburb boy. Well, I didn't know what an actor was until uh, well after I started singing and dancing and, and kind of expressing myself artistically. So when I was a baby, my family says I would rock myself to sleep. They put me in that rocker and I would like lean back and forth and hum and then just pass out. <laughs> uh, and then when I got older, I was always watching martial arts movies. I was memorizing commercials, uh, mimicking them. Um, mim mimicking the voices. I loved Michael Jackson, so I would like watch things that he would do and buy, get the outfit and stuff. And um, I think it was when I got a little older and I really got into martial arts and I saw Jackie Chan and Power Rangers, that's when I thought, oh, I want to be an actor. Um, but I just didn't see as many people who looked like me up there. And, um, and I was also dealing with like, the fact that I lived in a city which is primarily filled with minorities and the minority for my upbringing was actually white people. So I grew up in a very diverse um, place. And, uh, and even though it was a suburb of San Francisco, I didn't have as much support in the LGBTQ side of my identity until I was older. Um, but uh, I, I know for a fact when I was younger, I naturally was attracted to men, but I also saw the beauty in women. And so it, was, it took me a long time to kind of figure out who I was and what that all meant. Um, but it, it, it all worked out really, really well. Cause as I, as I got older and I did acting and I got my first black belt, my second black belt, I did community service. I started to just identify these areas of my life where I was passionate. And now whenever people, when I teach and people ask me like, oh, what's your advice? And one of the pieces of advice I give is follow the energy. And this is not new information. I've learned all these things from just watching YouTube videos and finding really amazing authors and speakers, the, the leaders of mental technology, of meditation, of being, of doing, of managing. Um, and I just kind of made that my job throughout my life because I was raised to be want to be a doctor or be a businessman, which it was not my style. But what's funny is that my dad said, I, you can do anything with your talents because you're so talented. And he didn't want me to do anything but what he knew. And so I didn't have a uh, a father figure who was rooting for me to do the things that I wanted. He kind of just paid for the things that I wanted to do to appease me. But I'm, I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't gonna, he, I'm pretty sure my dad didn't know that I would be here in front of you having an interview. He did not know that was possible. But fortunately for me, I saw glimmers of it in my imagination and I was around people who saw it for me. And over time, I started to see what they saw. And I spent a big chunk of my career <clears throat> trying to just uh, show my dad wrong. Like, hey, I, I can do this. And um, eventually uh, that led to me figuring out like, actually, I need to do this for myself. You know, I need to do this for what it means, you know, for my, the community that the communities that I belong to, whether it's the LGBTQ community, the Asian community, the Broadway theater community, you know, cause I come from live theater, um, or even like the Daily City community. I studied acting, well, where I went to school was the Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts in Santa Maria, California, which is a two year acting training program. Um, run through a junior college, uh, and that was 2001 to 2003. Um, but prior to that, I right before that, I actually met my 
acting coach who helped me get into PCPA at the Youth Conservatory ACT Theater, which is ironically where I saw my very first play in high school at the ACT Theater. And next to it was the Curran Theater, another big theater touring house where I saw Phantom for the first time as a kid. I saw my first live musical and was astonished. Um, and I'm, what's kind of cool is like full circle moment, my first big job after a national tour touring the country was White Christmas and the opening theater was The Curran in San Francisco. And so three years later I did the cast recording, but I helped create that show. And I got to say, hey, I originated the show when we opened in my hometown. I was so proud and I felt like I must be doing something right because I get to represent where I'm from. And I was in the ensemble, but I didn't care because I knew that there'd be people in the audience who would see a Filipino guy or someone who's not white or black on stage and see my name, Rodriguez, and like, oh, is he Latino? Is he Mexican? It's like, no. And the, uh, many people would like, no, that guy's Filipino. And, and that mattered to me because I didn't have that growing up. Um, I had like Dante Bosco and Paulo Montalban, and they were great sources of inspiration, but I didn't really see a lot of young Asian leading men. Um, and so, uh, so it's cool to be where I'm at because I, my, my, big, my big role was Josh Chan, which is a, which is a straight Filipino bro and from SoCal. And, but the truth of it was like, I'm a gay Filipino dude from Daly City who got a lot of mixed messages when I was younger on who to be and how to be and what, what job I should have and what roles I should be right for. It, let me just tell you this, it wasn't leading men. That's not what they th wanted for me. So me being here in front of you, doing this interview is against odds, against my dad's wants and it's against what uh, many people thought just wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah, and with love, I, I got to play Henry, Henry, um, and who's a, who is described as a Filipino bisexual dreamboat. That was the description. Um, talk about pressure. <laughs> I remember reading that and going, I'm adding another day to the gym uh, because of that. Um, not because they asked me to. People ask me that all the time. Why are you bulking up? Why are you, you know, doing all this work? And it's so funny that they ask me that because I'm doing my job. I have an artistic standard for what I do, just like a photographer does or a model does or a singer or a painter or a photographer or a makeup artist. I have my own level of what is bare minimum. And because of my theater background and my, up, my Filipino upbringing and um, how I was raised and the amazing people who not, I don't want to say mentored me. Yeah, I guess I could say mentored me. I had a lot of older friends growing up, some straight, some gay, some bi, some married, some single, some men, some women, it didn't matter, but they all kind of rooted for me and saw me for who I was and who I wanted to be. And um, so when I got this opportunity to play Henry, I was astonished because this doesn't exist out there in TV, in Hollywood. You want me to play a Filipino American young man who's bisexual and he's a dreamboat? That's it? And I went, I've watched rom-coms. This character's played by a white guy almost every time. And so when I got this part, I thought I have an opportunity to normalize sexuality in the, fiddle, in, in the Filipino culture. Because when I was a kid, I, I felt like, well, I don't talk like the, like, the, like the members of my community talk. Like, I don't, I don't see role models who are showing me the various nuances and gray areas of sexuality. And that's a really important thing for us to acknowledge right now because it's a spectrum, just like colors of the rainbow, you know? Um, how appropriate, because Rainbow flag, hey, pride. Um, but yeah, so, so playing that role on, on With Love was very pivotal for me and it allowed me to uh, represent in a way that I had not been given the chance to. Because it's very different than Josh Chan. Um, their paradigms, their outlooks on life are very different.
I also started training with the acting center during the pandemic um, and it saved me um, artistically because I don't prepare as an actor the same way. I also don't look at my life the way I used to. I don't, I'm not racing against anyone now because uh, that's like a finite mindset. Um, I read a lot of si Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Um, and like, I don't, I'm not gonna race against my, my colleagues. It's not a race. Uh, I'm an infinite player. I work hard and smart every day to continue playing the game so that I can always play and have a career that isn't just TV and film. I also do voiceover work. I do animation, I do video games. You know, I'm a teacher, um, you know, and, 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 and like I said before, at the beginning of the interview, it's just my way of following my passion, following where my energy goes. And I think when you tell someone that and they actually do it, this amazing thing called joy happens and people wanna be around that. And that is also how we create awesome things. So that's, this, that's kind of the new path I'm on. And uh, it took me a long time to discover that all these things could kind of work together. And it, I didn't know it was gonna happen. I had to kind of go, well, I'm not sure if it's gonna happen, but I'm gonna put it out there and I'm gonna pay attention. And so my awareness has grown so much to the point where like I've let go of so many things that most people are like kind of adamant about. And you know, pe some people like, oh, I'll do fast food, I'll do this. And like, oh, I'll just eat this little thing here. And then, you know, I don't need that much sleep and oh, I'll just have a drink and like, oh, the social media. And I just wiped so much of that off my plate. And then all of a sudden I realized I had an appetite for all these other things that brought me joy and kind of resulted in a happy life and a balanced life. Um, and that has helped me artistically and my family, me and my husband, our dog Kona, she's adorable. She's a year and 10 months. And my, my relationships, both personally and professionally, and my relationship to myself as just a person and as, a, as, a, as an entertainer um, and as a facilitator of art whether it's on camera or in a vo voiceover setting or um, just artistic expression, which I think is something we all have in this and something that is important to explore. And that's something I pride myself in representing whenever I'm at the gym or at a dance class or singing or um, talking with theater friends, you know, TV friends or auditioning for movies. Like I'm doing all those things, um, but not one is more important than the other. It's just kind of, an orchestra of different plants that I get to water throughout my life. So I feel very blessed to have the garden I have. So when I graduated from PCPA in 2003, I booked the first national tour of 42nd Street and I very proudly called my dad who did not want me to, to he did not think I was gonna book a job that quickly, um, but he had given me this you know, Filipino dads, giving me this ultimatum like, hey, if you don't make $100,000 after you get out of college, after you finish this program, you need to come back home, live under my roof, get a degree and do everything that I want you to do and you can't do theater. But as soon as you get a degree, you can go off into the world and do whatever you want. I did not want to wait. And I did not want, and I did not want him picking that for me. And I guess the universe heard me because I graduated in May, 2003. And after a solo trip to LA to audition for Mamma Mia and 42nd Street, national and Broadway companies at the time, they were, they were happening. Um, I, had a, I got seen for Mamma Mia. I'm pretty sure I got a call back. And then I got another call back for 42nd Street and that moved forward. And the week of my birthday, August 10th, I think I turned 21. I, uh, I booked the first national tour of 42nd Street right out of college. And I called my dad and said, Dad, I booked the first national tour of 42nd Street, this Broadway musical. I'm going to tap dance around the country for the next nine months. I'm really excited. I'll be home for a month and then I'm going away. Okay, I love you. Talk to you later. Bye. Like, didn't ask him. I just told him. And that set me off on this amazing path. And, um... Oh, yeah, sure. What was the question again? Teaching, okay. So, are ready? Yeah, okay, we're good. So, this set me on an amazing path and an awareness of what I knew 
and how not only was I thirsty to learn on the job, you know, because I'd been in school for two years and two summers, and now I have my equity card. I'm wearing thousands of dollars worth of shoes and costumes that I've never worn before. Clothes are tailored to my body. I have a body, I have a mic pack that's like, has my name on it, has my number on it. I, you know, all these things that like you dreamt of in college and now I got to do it and I, and I lived it for nine months. Um, I had no money at the end of that nine months, but I went to New York and, and I realized like, I wanna share what I learned. And so I, I went back to PCPA and I, and I said to my principal, Hey, can I teach? I'd love to teach a combination from the from the show. And he says, oh my gosh, that would be incredible, Vincent. We're so proud of you. And yes, of course, of course. And I said, would you guys be, I don't mean to sound weird, but would you pay me? Or would it, you know, I'm happy to do it for free. And he was like, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. We will be paying you. And I'm like, why? And he said, we're proud of you. You did it. You're working. We're going to pay you for your value. And that is something that really resonated with me. So I made it a point to teach at PCPA, teach at my high school, and all these places I grew up in, YPT, MTC, the Young People's Team Musical Theater Company in San Francisco. I actually just texted them yesterday saying, hey, I'm gonna be in town next week. Do you wanna, <laughs> are there rehearsals I can visit and say hi? Or you know, do you want me to teach again? Because as even though Teaching is a great way to, to make money, you know, and to keep yourself busy if you want to be busy. At first, I'll, I'll admit, it was a great way to pat myself on the back for my accomplishments, but, it, but through age and wisdom and the grindstone of New York, um, all of a sudden I started to teach technology. I started to teach how to help people, how people could help themselves and get what they want and achieve bigger, greater things in their career. Cause I started to learn how to do that. So I kept wanting to pass it on. And every time I taught it, I learned it twice. So I would, I always taught. It was just a part of my being. And to the point now, like I played a trainer on an episode of Home Economics, which will air by the time this goes out. Uh, and in the beginning of the scene, I'm not, on, I'm kind of on camera, but my, I'm leading a class outside. And, and I watched the two characters off camera, like doing their scene and I saw the camera on them. And I was in front of like 20 background actors, I, knowing I needed to lead them in a class and we're gonna be on camera. So without even kind of thinking about it, I just went, what would my character do? And so I started forming a warm up, and I started to guide them and relate to them and some of them would do it and some of them wouldn't. So I learned like who's in the scene, who's not in the scene. And I started coming up with, a real, I started just letting my creativity and my imagination flow and all of a sudden before I knew it, I had a set warm up routine for these strangers to the point where I just needed a wave on, off camera for a cue line so I knew when to go from the class that I made up into dialogue that was scripted. And they loved it and I thought it was great. And in my head, I'm just doing my job, doing what I think is my job. And, and they went, yeah, you, you got it. And I'm like, cool. I didn't ask permission, I just did it. I just know what my job is. And I got to collaborate with some amazing people. Um, but I got to just do, you know? So leading others and, asking questions, being curious as opposed to judgmental, that's been huge for me. Process over perfection. I have post-it notes all over my office and the house saying, do the thing, um, you know, do the thing. Progress over perfection. Just, it's okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it done and it'll get better. <laughs> I, so I've dealt with a lot of mental illness during the pandemic, so. Now I'm on antidepressants, which are so not a big deal. <laughs> um, that's a song from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, and, I, I, we get, and we still get a lot of people messaging and re-binging the show, reintroducing it to new people. And those people reach out to us. The show's been like off air for six years, but um, it still resonates with a lot of people and it touches on a lot of really dark um, challenges that we face, no matter how old you are. Or, or how you identify. And we address that on our show in a profound, 
fun, silly, and digestible way through the music videos. Over 125, written by Rachel Bloom, Adam Schlesinger, and Jack Dolgen, choreographed by our Emmy Award-winning um, choreographer, Catherine Burns. We won, we won Emmys for both choreography and music, um, and we're still in like top 10 lists right to this day of shows to re-watch, and, or important shows to watch. And so I felt very honored to be a part of a show that could highlight like not that this is necessarily the underdog, but represent so much diversity and inclusivity and normalization of so many things that we as a society have unnecessarily tabooed. And so I got to be a work with Aline Prosh McKenna, our showrunner who wrote Devil Wears Prada, 27 Dresses, We Built a Zoo, the Annie remake, and now she has her own production company and Rachel Bloom. Like, I mean, I worked, my bosses were female. The company was mostly female. I was in this amazing environment and I learned so much. I was there for four seasons. I affectionately called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend like where I like graduated like film school, TV school. Cause I didn't know how to do it when I got there. I didn't know what a mark was. I didn't know what an eye line was. I was the theater guy that they hired to be the love interest in this TV show. And, uh, and I learned so much. By the time I got to season four, I was teaching on camera classes. I was doing stunt in action and met my trainer and started living this whole new life that, um, that I feel very blessed to have. The advice I have for any Filipinos out there who are gay um, or not, um, but want to pursue stage work TV work, film work, voiceover work, anything artistic, my suggestion is to follow the energy, follow your passion. And that also means though, you have to take care of the things that take care of your passion. So, you, so you don't, you're not just a singer. Like you realize being a singer, you have to take care of your voice. If you're on stage, you need to take care of your appearance. You have to take care of your skin. A lot of what we do when you're on camera or you're, you are the product, it, it, you are the product. So like, um, you know, as people were asking earlier, oh, did you get cupping done? And yeah, I got cupping done on my shoulders and my back because I, that's one of the ways I take care of myself. So you have to take care of yourself and you have to take care of what you want and how you see yourself contributing to whatever this is, this life. Everyone has different religious beliefs and outlooks on life, um, you know, and I think it doesn't matter where you're from. I think, it, I think it's really important to remember where you come from and where you wanna go. And keep in mind, it doesn't matter where you start. It matters how you finish and what you do with the tools and the training you already have, which you can always grow and you can always sharpen. So take that first step. Oh, I stumbled. Great. Do it again. Great. Do it again. Ah, oh, I fell. Great. Do it again. Repetition is a great way to get to know yourself and asking questions, being curious as opposed to judgmental is another way you can level up and Learn new things, learn about different cultures, be curious, look up words in the dictionary, read different scripts, meet different people who have different outlooks than you, who walk different than you, you know? Be curious, because as you get to know the world, all of a sudden your imagination has more input and now your dancing is different, now your singing is different. Now, how, now when you read a script, you have 50 ideas. Whereas when you first read scripts in college, you're like, how do I do my job? Oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. But it's like, well, how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you approach it with fear, that's what you're gonna get, fear. But if you approach it with love and enthusiasm and gratitude, that's what you'll get. So how did, you get, how did I get good at tap dancing? Or how did I dance like Gene Kelly before I even knew how to tap dance? I would just dance around like Gene Kelly, even though I didn't know how to tap dance. <laughs> because I enjoyed it. Simply because I enjoyed it. The moment I learned choreography, to these movements that I had never known the actual steps for, it was at the 42nd Street audition. And I dressed like Gene Kelly from An American in Paris. Slacks, white, um, white tank top, suspenders, dress shirt over it, untucked, two-tone shoes, 
high water pants, slacks. That's how I showed up to that audition. When I saw him teach the steps to these movements that I've always known, I was so overjoyed. I was a beam of light. I danced the out of that choreography. And after I booked the job and was about to close the show, I was out having drinks with the dance captain, Jeremy Benton, who's a very good friend of mine now, and we're still in touch. And he's now a leading man. Musicals all over. We were in White Christmas together, original cast. And I said, Jeremy, I have to have a question for you. Why did you hire me for this job? I'm the worst tap dancer in the show. I'm the least experienced. Why did you hire me from that dance call? And he said, because Vinny, I taught you the choreography. I can teach anyone the choreography who's a dancer, but when you danced, you were so happy and excited to be doing what you were doing. And you obviously knew how to dance like that and what it meant to dance like that. And that's why we hired you.